Uh, welcome to Cancer Focus Week. Um, today, I'm really lucky to have as my guest, Dr. Lori Koger. And uh, she's, if you've never gotten the opportunity to meet her in person or hear her speak, you should, because she is a wealth of information. And I'm very grateful that you have agreed to take time out of your day to be here and talk about the important subject of spay neuter um, in the context of cancer, but also in the context of some other things. <laughs> Absolutely. It's one of my favorite topics. Really? <laughs> Absolutely. I'm, you know, let's, let's just put it out there. I am all for leaving our dogs as nature intended as much as possible. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, I, I feel like kind of with ourselves and with their animals, everything that's going wrong is because we've kind of screwed up mother nature. Like we all these environmental toxins and pollutants mm -hmm. and plastics and just like, so, and, and then ripping out body parts and injecting things that <laughs> we shouldn't sure. be injecting. 200%. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's just, well, and, and I mean, we can extend this to food, which is also one of our favorite topics. Uh, yeah. Why yeah. do humans feel this need to make it more convenient, make it more, you know, human friendly and lose our respect for the integrity of our dogs and cats bodies? Exactly. And, you know, a lot of it, I guess we could put down to, oh, well, we're so busy. We're running around. We've got careers and jobs and this and that and the other thing. But, you know... Think about our ancestors who were forging their way across the country in a wagon and then trying to chisel out in rocky desert soil <laughs> little tiny gardens. Like those people worked from four in the morning until midnight. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They were the reason for daylight savings time, right? I mean, they, they changed the clock so that they would have more working daylight hours. Exactly. You so. know, we, we don't own the market of being busy. And I mean, even the school year revolves around harvest season, Correct. planting and harvest and hunting. Like I grew up in Southern New Jersey and I know everybody thinks of where are we digressing already? Yeah. Everybody thinks of New Jersey as the armpit of New York city, that it's just city and pollution and smog and smoke, mm -hmm. but it's also called the garden state. And so I grew up in Southern New Jersey, which is all farmland, very, very rural. Yeah. And the first day of hunting season, the class in high school, those classrooms were empty because mm -hmm. <laughs> everybody was out hunting. And when it came time for harvesting or planting, half the kids in the school were farm kids. And by the time right. you got to high school, you were helping on the farm. It's like, yeah, I got to miss some classes today because we got, you know, this, that, or the other thing that's yeah. time sensitive. So yeah, we, we've totally gotten away from all of that. Yes. And Southern, no, we, we, Southern New Jersey, guys, in case you haven't been there, is beautiful. It is. It is beautiful really farmland. beautiful. It is not urban. It is not city. <laughs> it is not any of your preconceived notions. Exactly. That's what everybody says. What you know when you you say you're from Jersey, everybody says what exit? Well, they're talking about the Garden State Parkway, which goes up the east side of the state, which does go through the sure. armpit of New York. But that's not where we were. <laughs> mm -mm. Anyway, yeah, we are really off topic. So <clears throat> now you happen to have a bunch of intact dogs at your house, correct? I do. I have currently, I have four Australian shepherds of my own breeding. Every dog I own at this moment has been born in my house Aww. in, and in some cases by my hands because we did a C-section. Oh, geez. Um, yeah. Talk stress, C-section your <laughs> own. And when I say bitch, I am respectfully referring to the correct term for an intact female, female dog. dog. <laughs> try try C-sectioning your own bitch at five in the morning. <laughs> Talk about pressure. But anyway, everything has gone well. So yes, at the moment I have three intact girls and one almost 13 year old neutered boy. Neutered. Okay. And, and he was neutered. When was he neutered? At three years of age. And and I generally I don't I'm not sure what you do, Judy. I kind of categorize spay neuter by three ages. There's pediatric, there's pre-puberty. And there's mature. So I would classify Puck as a mature neuter done at three years of age. I agree. Yeah. The pediatrics are the ones that are 
really scary and yes. really the worst in my opinion. And that could um, be anywhere from eight weeks of age to I would I would probably go to sixteen weeks would I would consider pediatric. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, it's, it's basically what we're trying to do them before they go into their first heat, which is what we have taught for, oh my gosh, yes. we yes. have convinced, well, the vet schools have, have convinced all the veterinarians, all the, the you know, the new, the new and old graduates, they've convinced everybody, oh, you got to say them before they go into heat. Mm -hmm. And we have done such a good job over the past 50 years, banging that into people's heads that people automatically assume that six months is the correct age for spay and neuter. Mm -hmm. But now we have all these great studies. Yeah. Now, now we know. And now we know. the so, rescue groups have taken it even further beyond, you know, prior to their first heat, which I would consider, you know, that's the six month, that's the pre-puberty. They want to do them pediatric. They want them before they adopt out Mm -hmm. A kitten that might not even weigh two pounds. Yeah, that they was our cutoff for the shelter. They had to yeah. weigh two pounds. So if they came in at one pound, 14 ounces, they got sent back to the shelter for another week. Yeah. Uh, when I worked which at the stinks. shelter, which I did for about five years, they had me doing a pound and a half kitten, <sighs> which is essentially six weeks of age. Yeah. And, you know, what a disservice to those individuals to rip their hormones from them during such a critical phase, during yeah. growth, during skeletal matur maturation, during, you know, cognitive development, yeah. not a good idea. But I understand the rescue group's focus on not producing more rescue animals. I, yeah, I, I understand it too. And our local shelter that we did all the work for, um, they used to do it where people prepaid for their spay and neuter and they mm -hmm. were supposed to then, you know, adopt them and then take them to their vet when they hit six, seven months right. of age um, before they went into their first heat. I mean, they were still pushing that, but at least they weren't getting done at eight weeks of age. Mm -hmm. uh, and when they looked back at the records over a 10 year period, they found that only 33% of the people actually got them spayed and neutered. And so yeah. when you, you look at how irresponsible people are, um, and we, the shelter was just, you know, it was constant reruns. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I adopted this dog. Now I want to turn in her puppies. Um, and if they, if somebody came in with puppies, then they would take the puppies, but only if the parents were then right. spayed and neutered. And so they had right. to get that done, but still it's, um, so we have in the past, I say decade, maybe, I don't know when the, the golden retriever and the Rottweiler studies uh, yeah, we're yeah, within done. within the decade, I think. Yeah, the money. I think it's it's getting close to that old now. Um, but there were great studies done in the golden retrievers and the Rottweilers, which partly because there's a very large population of both of those breeds, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of them in the show ring. And so when they're in the show ring and they're showing for confirmation, they have to be intact, right? I'm not a show, correct? Person, but they have to in, be intact. in confirmation, not in performance events, right? Right. So, so that meant that there was a huge pool of dogs that they could look at because we have, you know, there's golden right. retrievers are, there's a lot of them. There's a, there's yeah. a lot of Rottweilers. So I don't go to dog shows very often. I used to speak at them and have uh, booths at them, um, you know, so I could kind of see what was going on. And so you get these, you know, I don't want to say weird breeds, but smaller breed groups where less, there's a less couple common, of dogs. Less common breeds. Yeah. Less common breeds. So you've got a few dogs in the ring versus, hey, here comes the golden retriever class. Yeah, there's a hundred dogs. <laughs> yeah, there's an entry of 132 golden retrievers. Right. They'll be so, they'll be going on all morning over in ring right. three. But it's a it's a it was a great way to be able to really get good data on look, here's a hundred spade females. Here's a hundred neutered males. Here's a mm -hmm. hundred intact females, a hundred intact males. Let's look at average lifespan. And, and there's a lot of breeders because there's so many dogs in the ring. Right. Um, it gave them a really good pool to be able to, to work with, to, to get their stats. So are there any other breed studies that you know of? Uh, the Vishla study on Vishla. temperament is the other on one that comes to mind. I knew there was a visual study. So was that um, looking at temperament in relation to spay neuter? In relation to spay neuter, in relation to aggression. Yep. And surprise, surprise, 
the spayed and neutered dogs that were spayed and neutered at a younger age had a higher incidence of aggression than the intact dogs. And when you think about it from a biological perspective, it makes perfect sense. What's the number one uh, duty of a species to reproduce itself? If you all are fighting amongst yourselves and hurting each other, you're going to remove candidates from the gene pool. So, you know, and, and I see it with my own dogs. You know, people say, how do you have three intact bitches? How are they not like killing each other? Like, you know, sorority sisters that don't get along or what have you. <laughs> and it's because they can communicate clearly. Yeah. And I believe, and I, I have no fact, I have no study for this, but that hormones are essential in the development of within the species communication. And I see my dogs just look at each other. And sometimes someone gives a look, someone walks away, you know, <laughs> someone gives a look and they lay down by each other. And, you know, that is com just communication. It's huge. Well, and if you don't have that, you might I, leap to a growl or a bite when it's inappropriate. Right. I think it was a rat study yeah. um, that they looked at ovary sparing spay, mm -hmm. where they took out the uterus and left the ovaries and found that their cognitive function was impaired by removing the uterus. Interesting. So people say, okay, the uterus doesn't do anything, but there actually are quite a few studies that mm -hmm. show even when you leave the ovaries yeah. and you take out the uterus, it has effects. So, you know, we kind of think, oh, all right, the uterus just sits there and waits for puppies and waits kittens for to egg. pop in. Yeah. But it actually produces hormones and produces um, a receptor. It has receptors mm -hmm. and produces things that have a function on the whole body. It's, it's, sort, of, it's sort of like every single body part has a function. Like, could you live without an arm? Yes. Would your life be more difficult? Yes. Can you live without a uterus? Yes. Is it going to impair some things? Uh-huh. <laughs> Potentially, yeah. And and I get how everyone is afraid of pyometra, of uterine infection. Um, you know, and that can be a life-ending, you know, medical problem. You know what? It can. However, there was a great study where they looked at uh, pyometra surgery mm -hmm. in a non-specialized setting. And actually it was in humane societies okay. where uh, dogs that were brought in with, with pyometra and had surgery in a humane society setting. So that's not going to be your big fancy. No, that's going to be with, uh, an it's, economical, it's gonna, hopefully efficient setting, but exactly. nothing fancy. And the survival rate was 97%. Yeah. So uh, Pio, in my mind, is extremely treatable. You just have to know the signs to yeah. watch for yeah. um, and be on top of it. And no, it's, it's going to occur about eight weeks after they have their heat cycle. Yeah, so if it you, happens at the time that puppies would be born. Right. So if you are a vigilant owner with an intact female, it's, it's something that you can catch and you can right. treat. So um, I'm trying to think like the only animals that I remember dying of pyometra in my 38 years of practice, we had my second year of practice, uh, we had a standard poodle that the people waited too long in mm -hmm. the pio. It was a closed pio that ruptured. Yeah. That and, and that's, and, and that's the big fear, isn't it? It's when yeah. the uterus is not draining and tissues rupture, but yeah, yep. it's, it's people that sit on it and, you know, certainly yeah. that's not our audience. Our audience is very <laughs> proactive. Pretty well educated. And yeah, and <laughs> which you know, is great. like, okay, she was in heat. Two months later, just make sure she's fine. Yeah. Um, and so, I actually did, I think, two for a, a breeder client of mine. She had open pios, and she said, I really, really want to have a litter from this bitch. And we did um, prostaglandin therapy where we caused the uterus to contract. Um, and you know, there's a whole, there's a whole protocol, but basically antibiotics and get the uterus to contract and expel the infective material. And then when those girls come back into season, you breed them on the next heat and then you're done. But we yeah. got litters after Pios. 
So yeah, not- I, I had a Doberman yeah. breeder who same thing. Uh, she came to me for the TCVM part. I did the acupuncture and yeah. herbs, and then she was uh, getting prostaglandin therapy, um, I believe, up at Red Bank. But um, you know, it it is something they actually can get through. They don't always have right. to be spayed. But you know, unless you have a really valuable dog that you yeah. really need to breed, it is recommended to go ahead and spay them. So with your own dogs, are these the first females that you've had that you're leaving intact long term or no. have you had others? No. Um when did I get when did I get my first girl? I, I was always a dedicated boy household and I've had as many as five intact males as my house and they were all Aussies. Um my first girl whose name was Flit, prop wash damselfly, uh came to me mm, probably pre late nineties, I'll say. And, um, she was wonderful, of course, and had, uh, she lived to the eight, the ripe old age of six. Um, yeah, exactly. Raw fed, minimally vaccinated daughter of a very popular male dog who I will not name, uh, who had a propensity for producing individuals with cancer. And hmm. I bred Flit. I got a litter of only three puppies and two of which had problems despite all the health clearances being good and all the right things being done. And before she subsequently developed lymphocytic leukemia, which was diagnosed off a of CBC. That's how wow. crazy it was. And was given a life expectancy of like six weeks. Well, she got a year and a year, year and a half um, with alternative methods, but succumbed to that. And she had numerous litter mates with hemangiosarcoma, cutaneous lympho. You know, that was one of the, what does Dr. Pope say? Five to 10% of genetic cancers. Genetic is very, very small percent actually. But this particular male dog crossed with anybody produced a high incidence. So that was my first female. Um, and then I got another, then came Trinket who um, lived to a ripe old age and was intact. And now I have Trinket's two daughters and her granddaughter who was three. Who was and a COVID so with that dog that um, lived to a ripe old age, did she ever develop mammary cancer? No, no, ma- yeah. no mammary cancer, no pio. Um, no problems. You know, I had lymphocytic leukemia, which yeah. is a but that's crazy, a, that's crazy. Another, another that's another one of the arguments for spaying right. early is the incidence of mammary cancer is much higher. How much but mammary cancer at, did you see when you were in practice? A fair amount. Okay. Um, but most of them we did. I had very few that succumb to mammary, yeah. mammary cancer. Uh, most of them we did like lumpectomies. I, I never did radicals, yeah. did lumpectomies. I didn't even go for lymph nodes. Um, and then we would use uh, herbs. Natural and method. Vitamin, yeah. you know, therapy and that sort I of mean, thing. And I they think always did well. I've, I've certainly done a few where there was, there were one or two glands affected. So yeah, a lumpectomy, a lumpectomy, a double, a triple. Right. You know, unless somebody had sat on it for years, it wasn't the whole chain. And again, right. if you're listening, be proactive. Don't sit yeah, on things. Find a lump, but memory find a lump, cancer is it. not my first worry with intact girls mm-hmm. at all. Mm-hmm. And no. I can, I mean, and th- if I've seen the Swedish one- and Norwegian studies where they leave the dogs intact, right. I mean, almost all dogs over there are intact through their right. entire life. Um, the incidence of mammary cancer and pyometra is actually really low. I think so. And I think there is a geographic predilection, but I think the reason for that, because as I compare notes with various veterinarians online and social media, it's geography of education and income and where they have all these problems, the people aren't educated to be proactive and they don't have the financial resources to do anything should they identify a problem? Well, and I think that that education and um, finances also plays into the food that they get fed. Good point. You know, 
uh, like, let's look at Norway and Sweden. That's an area where they eat a lot of fish. Yeah. And so the diets of those dogs are probably really high in omega-3s. Mm -hmm. um, I find that a lot of people that I talk to uh, through social media and emails uh, from those areas are feeding very healthy diets. Um, I think if we look at where the big pet food companies have come in and brought their preservatives and their poor quality foods, mm -hmm. uh, it's sort of like the countries like in Central and South America, the Caribbean, where they didn't have processed food and they didn't have soda or pop, mm -hmm. whatever we want to call it. They didn't have things with a lot of high fructose corn syrup right. and a lot of preservatives and a lot of salt. They were eating what they grew and caught and the animals were also eating the native foods. And as soon as, like there are great books on this topic. It, when you look at when the, like things progressed and they're, they got grocery stores in that had all these preserved- Convenience foods. Convenience foods. All of a sudden the health of the population, mm -hmm. both human and animal takes a nose right. dive. <laughs> Well, and I will say obesity becomes a bigger problem, yep. you know, high blood pressure becomes a problem, diabetes becomes a problem, where that really wasn't something that the native populations had an issue with, until this stuff gets brought in. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that plays a big part in it. And we are so far off topic. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so yeah, I can't so let's say that memory cancer stuff. Yeah, like memory cancer was not um, a reason to jump into Spain. but you know what Don't. was and it is the biggest misconception out there is prostatic cancer mm -hmm. you must neuter your dog or he's going to get prostatic cancer i call except that prostate cancer oh, is more common in neutered dogs. correct and my <laughs> colleagues do not know this and i did have a male dog with prostatic cancer diagnosed at about age 11 um, with liver mets and he lived a normal lifespan way beyond. We, we assume it was a prostatic adenocarcinoma based on the ultrasound finding calcified tissue in his prostate, calcified tissue, um, lived a couple years post diagnosis again with natural methods. And I credit mushrooms, his liver mets never grew beyond the size at which they were diagnosed which you find, you find me conventional chemo that can do that. Um, but exactly. that's the, that is the only case of prostatic cancer I've ever run into in 30 yeah, years of practice. I don't think I ever had a case of pro yeah. uh, prostatic cancer, uh, benign hypertrophy, of like course. an enlarged prostate. We saw that a lot. Yeah. Um, again, dealt with it. But, you know, I, I may have had a vet colleague yeah. friend. Why but it is, it is not common cancer? and mm -mm. statistically you're going to see it in neutered dogs, not yep. intact ones. Right. And then there's the argument for testicular cancer. Testicular cancer is Have you ever seen almost a case? always, I, well, I saw quite a few, but they were always benign. It's like Sertoli cell tumor. Yeah. I, no, I have benign. never seen a case. I've seen testicular atrophy, oh. but never oh, a cancer. No, no, I've gotten them, but they were always a ben yeah. like a benign cancer. They're not going to go anywhere. Right. So all of a sudden, you've, it's like, oh, I've got this big testicle. Okay, well, we're we're going to remove mm -hmm. the big testicle. Sure. Um, and but the, I've never, I never in thirty eight years of practice saw a testicular cancer that spread or, caused right. any issues. It's always localized to one testicle. Of course, when you neuter them, you, you take both, usually take sure. both. Um, but never uh, had a metastatic no. cancer. Um, so I think that's a bad argument as well. Yeah, I, I completely agree. <laughs> and I think, I think um, the only crazy thing that I've had clients say is they had their dog at the park and it might be a short coated breed on a hot summer day. And you could see that the dog was not neutered and they got shamed at the, at the, the park for having an unneutered dog on a leash, mind well, you. And it's crazy. We have the other problem because of lack of education yeah. of 
uh, not being able to bring your dogs to daycare, right. not being able to bring your dogs to boarding. Oh I mean, I can understand if you have a female and heat taking her to a daycare situation, dog play dates, probably you, you got to stay home for a little bit. Um, but you know, that's no different than if your kids are sick, you keep them home for it. Well, and uh, you know, oh my God, stand back. It's an unneutered male. I mean, we uncount, we encounter unneutered males on a daily basis in the human species. <laughs> you know, let's, let's be real, but I, I hear you daycare. If it's over six months of age, it's got to be spayed or neutered to come to our facility. Yeah. Right. And dog parks and those sorts yeah. of things. And so, I mean, it's one of those, it's, it's just like educating daycares, uh, boarding facilities, veterinarians, uh, on the difference between vaccinating every year and having a titer that says mm -hmm. they're, they're protected. Yeah, the vaccine works. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's uh, the same thing with spay and neuter that it's going to require this whole education. It's a paradigm again. shift for these people because yeah. they've been, yeah. and, and I got the mythology when I was in vet school, spay or neuter by six months, do this, do this, vaccinate twice a year if you're going to dog shows. I mean, it was what we believed then. And it's yeah. hard to learn something new and replace that thinking. It is. It is. And unfortunately, the vet schools are not replacing not as, that. Not as progressive yet. as we might like. But, you know, studies <laughs> like like Dr. Chris Zink is one of my favorites. Um, she, and hopefully we can, I'll share the link with you so we can share it with people. She's got the greatest summary article and collection of all the current spay neuter research where you can actually look at the data yourself and know that yeah, you know, it's it's a different world and the spaying and neutering carries a, an increased risk of cruciate ligament tears, an increased risk of various cancers, of all sorts of problems, of more aggression at, per the Vishla paper. And I mean, one of the ones that was scary for me uh, when I read it was the increased risk of osteosarcoma, one of the most devastating tumors that we deal with, especially in Rottweilers. And yep. pre-puberty neuter has a moderate increase in osteosarcs. And she only classifies things mild, moderate, you know, marked. But that's huge. Yeah. That's huge. It is. I mean, I, I, they have pretty good proof. Uh, hemangiosarcoma, osteosarcoma. Uh, was mast cell tumor on the list? Mast cell tumors well? on the list. Um, you know, the mammary tumors we already talked about, but, um, you know, a lot of the immune mediated things, it's not just cancer. It's kind of the paraneoplastic immune mediated hemolytic anemia, immune mediated thrombocytopenia where the dog's going to destroy their own platelets. Hypothyroidism. I mean, how many hypothyroid goldens have we seen between us? <laughs> Well, and it's interesting because whenever I would spay or neuter a large breed dog, uh, even mature dogs, so sure. people would wait till four years old or they're done breeding right. and they want to go ahead and get them spayed, I would monitor the thyroid levels because nine times out of 10, within six months, they're hypothyroid. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's just the the ovaries and the testes and i'm going to classify the uterus as one mm -hmm. of these hormonal uh, glands as well um they, they don't function by themselves they're part of the endocrine system so it's the thyroid the pineal the pituitary right. everything the talks to thymus. everything else right and so when you take one big piece of the puzzle away again if you lose a limb the other three limbs are going to have to pick up the slack, pick up the slack. So, and, and I think that's part of the reason, um, Cushing's disease yeah. where the adrenal glands, uh, you know, and Addison's disease, I, it's the adrenal glands are kind of like, I don't know whether to make more, make less, mm -hmm. or I just, I give up. Yeah. A vital um, information source feedback loop for them is missing. And I, I find yeah. it very interesting that in Dr. Oberbauer's study, spayed females were the most affected uh, compared to, you know, intact animals and neutered males. It's like there's something about removing the sources of estrogen and related female hormones that really hits the body hard. And when you think about the pet population, 
depending on your geography, everybody wants to spay the girls. They'll leave the males intact in, you know, John Q. Public's hands because she's, they're not causing trouble. They're lifting their leg on the tree, but oh my God, the female's bleeding in the house. We can't have this. And the females have higher risks of all these immune mediated diseases as well as the cancers once you rip their uterus out and ovaries. Yeah. Yep. And let me just say, uh, right now I have two neutered boys and an intact boy. Uh, the neutered boys came to me that way. So I right. had no say in that matter. The intact boy came to me as a puppy intact. And so he's still intact. Everybody lifts their leg. I don't care if you're neutered, not neutered. It, it's a leg lifting fiesta. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, <laughs> so if you have a dog that is marking and you think that neutering them is going to stop that behavior, eh, eh, it, it is a behavior. It's marking. Again, I have this quote where I say, we invite dogs to and cats to live in our world. And then we expect them to not do dog and cat things. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. And for me, it's like it's a training issue. I have intact male dogs. They do not lift their leg in my house. And actually, Puck, my oldest, he has never lifted his leg, which is... You're a much better trainer than well, I am. I, I already knew that. But <laughs> it's, the, it's the same thing we preach. Be proactive. I know it's going to rear its head at some point, and I am incredibly prepared to make that the last time. So, you know, they, they don't have too much freedom early on. I never let it get established. But... You know, I come to it knowing how important it is to me. And yeah. I mean, Puck just has <laughs> never lifted his leg. You know, he's a powerhouse dog. He's full of drive. He could go herd 50 cattle without even thinking about it. But he's a squatter. It's a gift. <laughs> and that's fine. And you know, what? I've had females that are sure. markers. Our first Cavalier, which was Gwen's dog. Oh my gosh, what a marker. That and she didn't mark in the house, but we go for a walk. She'd have to stop every three feet to mm -hmm. mark something. <laughs> so yeah, it's just amazing. So yeah. you know, it's I think it's more of an individual personality I, I thing. Agree. But anyway, we're off the we're we're totally off yeah. The how are we doing this? Um, I don't know. I it just keeps going. But the bottom line is that we know for a fact now there haven't been enough studies done in small breeds mm -hmm. because there was a big article that came out. I think it was in like veterinary practice mm -hmm. news or something. Um, and they listed like 30 breeds of dogs, you know, of different sizes mm -hmm. and gave arbitrary numbers. Like, I don't oh, know how they I come up with this stuff. Paper. Like, remember that? Yeah. So it was like, oh, you have a small breed dog, like the Cavaliers. You have a small breed dog, go ahead and, and spay yeah. and neuter them young. It's it's no big deal. You have a large breed dog, you want to wait until yeah. the, the growth plates close. And I think that's what they were kind of I basing think you're it on. Right. They were like, okay, well, and but so they were like, okay, well, wait till 12 months for this breed, wait till 18 months for this breed, wait till 24 months for this breed. And I was like, what is that yeah, based on? And like, why is it okay to do, to do it to a toy poodle, spay neuter? but not a standard? You know, and, yeah. and for me, my biggest gripe with the, especially the uh, pediatric space is their little vulvas never develop and they have this recessed vulva and urine collects and urinary there problems. when they pee and they just are consigned to urinary tract infection after urinary tract infection. I, yeah. so, so you know, many problems. I do not care what size it is. I want it to physical maturity. And for me, that may mean it goes through two to three heat cycles. Mm -hmm. yep, and exactly. that's in the best interest of the individual. And, you know, yeah. obviously I counsel my owners as, as you do, you know, you have to be responsible. Don't let your dog get bred. I lived in a, <laughs> I lived in a two bedroom townhouse with Flit, my first intact bitch and Pesto, my intact male. And I survived multiple heat cycles in a two bedroom townhouse. Somebody was always in a crate and <laughs> the other had freedom. If things were really stressful, they might both be in a crate, but it was a week. And then I got to a point right. where I had a friend I trusted that Flit could go there when she was standing. Hey, this one wants to come, come, come to camp, camp you know. <laughs> 
I've had clients who have had to do yeah. that. They're like, oh my gosh, my but, male is not eating. He's going yeah. crazy. And it's like, okay, well, you know what? That's just yeah, hormones. It's, but it's, it's, it's over in a week. It's no different than teenagers. It's over in a week. <laughs> it's a small <laughs> price to pay for the longevity yeah. and not dealing and with no. health problems yeah. that, that can be avoided. And I think we need, I think we need a lot more studies. We do have, we do have the Rottweiler and the golden study. There is a definite link between spay yeah. and neuter and some of the nasty, nasty cancers that we're seeing. I think we need uh, more breed yeah. groups to get involved. And, you know, it, it can be something as simple as sending out a survey, mm -hmm. but the problem is you've got to find an equal subset yeah. of um, intact right girls and yeah. boys and then spade yeah. and you're girls only going to find that with really good <coughs> preservation breeders is the the term that's used yeah. um you know like i know where my puppies are and i can pick up the phone or, or just shoot an email or text and say you know any concerns but you know and of course the breeders ha have their own intact populations but if somebody right. bought their doodle from a backyard breeder you know, there are no health clearances, generally speaking. We have no genetic data. They don't know where their puppies are. And there's no way to get right. that that population of right. dogs that came from here that are spayed and neutered at younger ages. And it's also really hard to do like a double blinded whatever yeah. study because uh, unless you have all the dogs in a colony... Right? with the same environmental exposures, the same dietary exposures, the same handling mm -hmm. and stress exposures. Um, it really is very difficult to compare apples to Correct. apples. So yes, here we have a hundred spade female pick a breed and here we have a hundred intact, but yeah. are they all being yeah. fed the same well, way? Are and, they all, what's, what's right. the vaccine status? Like how many vaccines has everybody had? So it be, because there are so many variables that can go into it, um, it can make it really difficult. Well, and to, then and then conventional veterinary yeah, medicine data. says, "At eh, study invalid, you know, too many things were not yeah. under your control." Instead of considering yeah. that, you know, this is the real world we're working in. This is the data set yeah. we have access to. What meaningful information yep. can we pull from it? and learn, continue to learn more. Yeah. I, I mean, I exactly. think of, let's take the golden retriever breed, pick up a copy of dog news, or you can go to dognews.com and look at the latest copy and see the goldens and think of how those dogs are handled compared to the average golden in a pet home. You know, you look at their beautiful coats. Well, they're groomed every week. You look at their body condition. Yeah. They're on the treadmill if they're not out, you know, exercising in nature. Doesn't matter if it's an ice storm in February, that dog is doing its five miles. And it's, it's a very apples and oranges sort of, of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So it's difficult to, to make those comparisons. Um, but hopefully they'll, they'll keep looking at statistics. I know that um, over at, in Helsinki, yeah. In Finland, they're doing a lot of really good studies at the university there with dogs um, and Dr. Anna, Anna Bjorkman. Awesome. I'm not going to come up with. Yeah, she's awesome. Yes, her. She's she's an ama she's an amazing person. She was speaking uh, at the conference yeah. in England. Um, you know the studies that they're doing there. They're doing a lot with raw feeding, but they're just they're really uh, looking at different factors and how they're affecting mm -hmm. dogs. And, um, I think it's really important research and, um, you know, unfortunately it takes so long to get results yeah. when we're doing, uh, research generations to get them, get them peer reviewed and get them studied and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, um, Lori, thank oh, you so much absolutely. for agreeing to have a conversation. Our conversations are always fun. Circuitous. Just a little, but <laughs> hopefully, hopefully we give people the information they're looking for. Yeah. So, um, and I, I, I will let the cat out of the bag. So to say, I do have a new book yes. coming out in September and it has a ton of the spay neuter studies cited in there with the findings. So uh, a lot of that information will be, um, uh, easy to digest and everybody can make up their own mind and their mm -hmm. own decisions. And, uh, 
We also have recommendations if your pet already has been spayed yeah. or neutered, particularly if they had a pediatric spay or neuter, because I, I know it scares people when we have these conversations and they're like, oh my God, I got him from the pound and he right. was spayed it, you know, neutered at six weeks. And um, there's, not ideal, there's always sure. something you can do though, to make it a little better. Always. Yep, exactly. Thank you very much, Lori. I appreciate you and I appreciate you. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's always fun. Ha, ha, ha.